I want to tell you, you know, you guys are blessed with Father Arbel. Isn't he awesome? <laughs> well, if, if you, have, you know, we've never had quite enough um, uh, American priests, so see, you're blessed through this wonderful gift from the Philippines to America in Father Arbel. In my day, growing up, the, low, the priests that came in to help who spoke English a little differently, you know, where were they from? Ireland. 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 Yes. Yes, it was from Ireland. So in my parish, there was Father McCarthy, this young priest from Ireland. He comes over to help in the United States in the Diocese of Providence, you know, and uh, he was charming. And after a year, you know, these Irish boys, they, they really are very, very connected to their mothers, just like Jesus said to Mary, right? So. He wants to go back and visit the old sod. So he goes back to, um, to Ireland for, for three weeks in the summer, which is a good, yeah, it's a good amount of time. And he's coming back. I lived in Providence, Rhode Island growing up on the East Coast. And the nearest big airport's Boston. So he's coming into Logan Airport. As he's going through customs, the guy's reading his papers. And he says, okay, Father McCarthy, welcome back to the United States. Now, do you have anything to declare? And he says, declare. What might you mean by that? No. Uh, well, um, do you have anything that you need to pay duty on? You know, like presents over uh, $600, gifts, um, alcohol. Oh, nothing of the sort. Mm -hmm. Well, um, do you mind if I inspect your bag? Wait, if you must. So he opens up the bag, and there's this humongous flask in there. And he shakes the flask, and there's liquid in the flask. He said, Father, do you mind telling me what's in this flask? Oh, nothing but a bit of holy water. Do you mind if I inspect it? Well, if you must. So he takes the, cap, the cap off, takes a whiff, and it darn near knocks him on his rear end. And he looks at the priest and says, Father McCarthy, this is 100% Irish whiskey. And McCarthy replies, Glory be to God, it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> In Ireland, Jesus changes water into whiskey. Now they are. So, anyway, um, we're going to talk about, about St. Joseph as a model for us today. And believe it or not, you know, who's our chief model, number one? It's Jesus, right? We're imitators of Christ. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we're imitators of Christ. And of course, all the saints are great models, but Christ is number one. But there, believe it or not, there's a way that Christ can't be our model. There's a very important virtue, and Jesus, the church teaches us, can't model this virtue for us completely. Why is that? Because it's the virtue of faith. And do you know that the church teaches that Jesus really didn't have faith? He didn't need faith. Because Jesus had what's called the beatific vision from the moment of his conception, all right? So it means that we really don't know what it means. We will have it in heaven. But it means that, remember what Paul said about faith? He said, now we see dimly as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Okay, now you say to yourself as an American, what does that mean? It's also translated, we see darkly as through a glass. Okay, well, what does that mean? All right, mirror for us today is gives us a, like a perfect image. We don't see dimly. We see like a perfect, it's a mirror image, but we see kind of a perfect two-dimensional image, right? Well, a mirror in the ancient world was a polished piece of metal. So think about looking at yourself, uh, at, on a, your reflection in a stainless steel refrigerator. Okay, it's fuzzy, right? It's not a clear image. Or... You've seen glass that's used in bathroom windows that, that lets light in, but you really can't see through it. You see, you know, that block glass stuff that's, okay, wavy. Okay, this is what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the fact that we're seeing something, but it, and it's fuzzy. It's not really, really clear, all right? So that, that's what he's trying to say is we walk by faith, not by sight. So in heaven, we won't have faith anymore. We don't need it. 
We won't have hope anymore, will you? Because hope is longing for and expecting what you can't see in the future. Well, we'll have that in heaven. So all that will be in heaven will be pure love. We won't need faith, we won't need hope. So Jesus somehow, despite the fact that he had a human intellect, he saw God. He had an immediate perception of God's glory that, that we don't have. And obviously he saw things that we didn't, don't see. Like he, he knew what people were, were thinking, right? Right? So what I'm trying to get across to you is Jesus didn't have the darkness that the rest of us human beings have to deal with when it comes to the things of God. So he can't model what it is to believe what you can't see. Part of faith has to do with believing what you can't see, what you can't completely prove. Like we see that, if you ask me, honestly, uh, and the church says this, you can prove the existence of God from creation with reason. Now, the church doesn't guarantee any particular proof is going to persuade everybody. But I, I think, you, you know, that with the church, it's actually part of Catholic do dogma, actually, that you can. But don't you, don't, wouldn't you say that you could see how a person doesn't believe in God? Because there's a beauty of that mount, those mountains over there. It's a beauty of the sky. But there's also evil in the world. There's also hurricanes and earthquakes. The, the, and, and so evil in the world, uh, people trying to explain evolution in, as if there's no need for God. People, Some people think that they can explain human beings completely by this natural process. I think that's crazy personally, but, but, I don't know, but still, you can, the point is, it's not like 100% in your face clear that you can't deny it, okay? Like even a miracle is that way. In this world, Miracles, to me, are clear, but to many people, they're not. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, uh, I, I've seen miracles. Like, like, I don't know if you guys have, in your experience, I think all of you have seen God work in a way, and you, you may say, man, that was a miracle, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of people can try to dispute it and try to explain it away. You see what I mean? In this world... God doesn't ever present himself to us in a way that takes away our freedom to say no. And that's part of this whole thing of faith, okay? You have to make an act of faith and freedom, even in the presence of miracles, even in the presence of the glory of, of creation. So and then what I'm trying to say is like that darkness that makes it fuzzy, that's something that Jesus didn't have the way every other human being had it. Even Mary and Joseph had that darkness that we have. Even, even Mary, who was immaculately conceived, who didn't have sin, still didn't have that vision that only Jesus had before heaven. In heaven, all the saints have it, and we'll have it. But in this world, Jesus had that kind of vision. So he can't model faith. He can't model what it means to walk by faith, not by sight. But Joseph can. So I, I want to talk about Joseph as a model of faith. But here's what I want to first talk about is I want to analyze what faith means, okay? And a lot of us have a problem in that we think that faith, Christian faith, is only b belief. You know, for example, commonly, just analyze the way we talk about this. People say, do you believe in God or do you not believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. What does that mean? Let's analyze that. What does that mean? That mean, believe, means I believe that there is a God. I believe that God exists. Now, is that a good thing? And the answer is yes. But it's just the beginning of faith. Hebrews gives us this. It gives us a bare bones definition of faith to start with. Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, no one can please God. For after all, you have to believe that God exists and that it rewards those who seek him. Okay, and that's the way most people are. Most people in our country, the vast majority of Americans, believe that God exists. Yes, it is shrinking, but still it's overwhelming. Most Americans believe God exists. If you go to the Czech Republic, only 33% of people believe that God exists. 
The communist secularism really did a horrible job there in really breaking down people's faith. I don't know why Czech Republic's so bad, but it's the worst in Europe. Okay, so here we're we're more like I can't remember what the latest stats are, but we're we're, we're like 90, 95 percent in America. It's really hot. Then and you, and and basically believe God exists and believe in it. You know that God rewards people after death. That 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 would be maybe not quite as high as God as God exists, but it's close. Okay, so a lot of people believe that, but look at our country. What is look at the shape of our country? Is believing that God exists? enough to, is that saving faith? Is that Christian faith? And the answer is by itself, it is not. Okay? Now, how about if you add in all the stuff that's in the creed? I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, could see the Holy Spirit, died on the cross, was raised, will come again in glory. Now that's better, that's more of the truth, and those things, you know, you can't see that stuff, for sure, but you believe it, so that's a good thing. Is that enough to save you? And the answer is no. Why? Because James says, even the devil believes that. Faith without works is dead. Now, another way of saying that is, faith that doesn't lead to action is dead. Just intellectual conviction alone is not enough. It's the beginning. But it's not enough. All right? So a lot of times, a lot, a lot of times we get confused. The way, the way the word faith is used in the New Testament is different. In different places, it's used in different ways. But saving Christian faith is never without two other things. So they, they actually, you got hope and love, right? So Paul talks about faith, hope, and love. You notice he always talks about them together. And one of the things he wants to get clear is, if you have, if you don't have love, it's worth it's all worthless. First Corinthians thirteen. But he's talking about the three of them. They're they're really only alive in dynamic unity. You really really can't love like God loves with charity without faith and hope. Okay, you can't have hope without faith, and you, you can't really have living faith without love. It's called dead faith. Love is like the soul. And faith is like the body, the beliefs. So if you have the beliefs and not any love, then you got dead faith, like a corpse. And that's what the church calls it. Honestly, that's what exactly what the church calls it. Now, I just want to analyze a little bit more and just use three little words that help us understand what faith is. Okay, first of all, faith is conviction about what you can't prove or what you can't clearly see. That we all got, right? Okay, but here's the next thing that you have to have. You have to have confidence or trust. So two C's, conviction, confidence. Let me give you an example of faith that talks and says it believes, but lacks trust. Okay, there is a Magician, kind of like a Houdini, evil Knievel kind of a dude. You know, you, everyone knows evil Knievel, right? Daredevil, right? Does amazing feats. Okay, so so there's this evil Knievel type dude who's doing this big daredevil feat. He's going to walk Niagara Falls. He has poles up, a tightrope suspended all the way across the falls, and next to one of the poles, there's a, a, a level area, and he's got thousands of people there. There's a bandstand, there's a sound system. People are gonna come see him walk the falls. So he gets up, you know, and starts revving up the crowd. How many people believe that I can walk the falls? Yeah, look at what I and they're all cheering. So he goes out and he just does it casually. He walks all the way to the other side, turns around, walks all the way back, it's like nothing. And people go wild. And then he puts a wheelbarrow on the stage and he says, how many people believe I can push this wheelbarrow on that tightrope all the way to the side and back? And they go, wow. And he does it. Goes over effortlessly. Total balance back. Now, as they're going wild as he comes back, he gets up on the stage and says, how many people believe I can put a person on that wheelbarrow and push them all the way to the other side and push them all the way back? Yeah! Okay, who will volunteer to be that person? Silence. <laughs> Silence. Okay. There's a lot of talk now about being vulnerable. Like if you listen to 
millennials talk and Gen Z people talk, it's a lot, there's a lot about importance of being vulnerable, making yourself vulnerable. Okay, faith involves trust. Making yourself vulnerable, putting yourself on the line. If you believe that he, he can push that across with a person there, why wouldn't you be that person? If you don't, if you don't, if you're not willing to be that person, you don't really believe it. You see what I mean? Okay, so it's, it's really, it's that simple. Now, this leads to the word amen. The word amen, what does the word amen mean? I believe. I believe. Okay. So be it. So be it. Okay. Now, saying so be it, saying I believe, you both write in some way. A lot of times we use amen like uh, so, so be it. In fact, it actually, there actually is a source in early church where someone explaining amen says it means so be it. But I want to tell you that the origin of the word is it's Hebrew. So every time you say amen, it proves you know some Hebrew. I like that. Congratulations. So you know Hebrew, you know amen, you know hallelujah. And you even know an Aramaic word, you don't even know it. Besides Abba, there's one Aramaic word that's still in our liturgy, and it's Hosanna. That's actually an Aramaic, not a Hebrew word. But anyway, now back, back to this is here. Amen is a Hebrew word. What's it mean? It comes from the, the word rock. It doesn't really mean exactly, I believe, or so be it. I mean, think about this. You go to receive Holy, the Holy Eucharist, and the priest says, body of Christ, and you say, so be it. It is whether you say it or not. They don't need you. <laughs> but, all right. but it means, it, it doesn't mean I believe. That's a little bit closer. It means I believe. But really, what amen means is, it is firm. It is reliable. You can stand on it. God is a rock. The key image of Hebrew scriptures is God as rock. And that means he's firm and he's reliable. He's not like the shifting sands that if you build your house on it, the house falls down. You can build on it. Okay, so when you say, amen, you mean I stake my life on it. So think of ice on the lake, Gazelle Lake. There's ice on Gazelle Lake. I don't know if it ever ice is over in the woods. All right, let's say there's ice on, like in, in Texas. We just had cold that we haven't had in 120 years. The last time we got this cold was when my grandfather was, was the, the year before my grandfather was born, 1898. Okay, so ponds, we never have ice on ponds. We have ice on the local pond, you know? And it's like, oh yeah, you can go out and skate on that. Really? Okay, go out and stand on it then. Okay, so it's ice. And if you really believe that ice is solid, you'll go out and stand on it. And if you're wrong, you will go be very cold, very fast, and very wet, right? So that's what amen means. Amen means you can go to the bank with it. It's firm. You can count on it. It's undeniable. It's certain. I, here's the important thing, I stake my life on it. That's what you say when you receive communion. All right? So confidence. I entrust myself. I surrender myself. I make myself vulnerable. I get involved. When you say, I believe that China exists, you're not involved. I believe God exists. You're not involved. If you're, you you got to entrust yourself to him. you got to, okay, so this trust idea is critical. If you don't get that, what I'm going to say is not making any sense about Joseph. Okay? So you got to get the darkness of conviction. That's clear. It's, there's darkness. So there's actually something very good about being willing to say, I, in the midst of the haze and the darkness and, and, and the unclarity, I believe in God's word. And then I believe in God's word really, so I'm gonna stake my life on it. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm gonna to surrender to it. Okay, now the third thing, so think about this image. First image, conviction, darkness. Second image, confidence, standing on a rock. Confidence, standing on a rock. I get out on the ice, I stand on the ice. Standing. Okay, the next one, different image. 
Walking. We walk by faith, not by sight. So walking means taking action. It means moving forward. And basically, what commitment is all about, so the third C is commitment. Okay? Conf conviction, confidence, commitment. Commitment means I'm committed to taking action based on my faith. I'm not going to just stand still because the Lord's word commands me to move and try, for example, to love, to be chaste, to be kind, to pray. So I'm going to take action. Now I may fall. Now look at Peter. Peter is a good image of faith in the boat. Lord, if that's you, call me to come across the water. Now, Peter, we can laugh at Peter, but that is courageous, and that's part of what faith is. And so what did Peter do? He stepped out of the boat. Okay, stepping out in faith, that's commitment. That's, he's definitely risking himself, but he's acting. And all the other guys in the boat are just there in the boat. <laughs> he's, he gets out. I mean, now he falters, all right? But at least he's moving. At least he's acting on God's word, right? He's trying to act. And so when we go to confession, in the, act of, in the act of confession, you know, I just went to confession. Thank you, Father, for making yourself available for this beautiful sacrament where we can meet Christ through your presence since you've been anointed to stand in the presence, in the person of Christ. So it's beautiful. But anyway, we, we say the act of confession. I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to sin no more. So that's commitment. I know I'm weak, I may not do it perfectly, but I am going to try to sin no more. I'm going to try, I'm willing to try to obey and be and actively obey, okay? So this is where faith without works is dead. What we're talking about here is we're talking about confidence and commitment. Commitment where, where you actually move out. So, you know, all this argument between Catholics and Protestants is kind of ridiculous. Faith and works. It's all about faith that works. Faith has to work, or it's not faith. So, it, you know, does faith alone save us? Well, intellectual belief alone doesn't save us, but the kind of faith that Paul's talking about is faith that is alive, and faith that works, and faith that stands and walks. So, anyway, that's what we're talking about. Now, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, there's the model of Abraham. Abraham has an encounter with an unknown God. You, know, you may not get this, but he's a pagan. He's living in a pagan land. He's a pagan polytheist. And it takes a while for his family to get rid of their idols. I don't know if you remember. There's actually stories of Jacob and, and Isaac and stuff. And, and they still not, you know, like, it takes a while to get rid of all this stuff, right? Get rid of it. So, but Abraham worships many gods. Because that's what everyone did. And he lives in the Mesopotamian region, which is like the, the center of civilization. So we're talking, you know, West Coast California, you know, on the coast of California, you know, where everything's happening around LA or New York. I mean, Abraham was living in the middle of civilization where culture is at its peak. Writing was invented in the area around where he lived about 1,200 years before he lived. So there's culture, there's place, there's temples, there's also stuff. And, and God, he has this encounter with God, and God speaks to him. Faith is always a response to God's word, okay? So God speaks to him. Abraham, take all your stuff, leave behind the comforts of civilization, come into the desert, to a land I will show you. You don't know where it is yet. You haven't seen it yet. But do it anyway. Trust me, commit yourself to walking. So Abraham... It, 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 it just says he did it. it did, it's like one of the most laconic things in the world. It's like, wait a minute, God, like, explain this to me a little bit more now. Are you serious? Go to, like, all my stuff, like, pick it up and move out into the desert. I, I, really? Like, like, where is this land now again? Like, tell me where it is. Tell me exactly what it's like. Tell me what we're going to get there. None of that. It's just like, he just went. And so he's the model of faith. And so God promises he's going to have, all he cared about was lots of descendants. And, and that's what God promised him. And yet his wife couldn't have a baby. And uh, she finally has a baby. And then the Lord says, off to, off to sacrifice. What does Abraham do? He just does it. Okay, that's why, it, and then God, of course, God doesn't really want the baby. God wants his heart. Well, God does want the baby, but not dead. 
He makes the baby into a mighty nation. It is through Isaac, his son, that Israel comes. Jacob and, and, and all of Jacob's 12, 12 sons. Okay, so anyway, um, the, the, but here's the point. You see the point? Darkness and walking. All right. Now, New Testament, we got two great models of faith in two Gospels. Now, there's more models of faith. But Luke gives us Mary as the quintessential model of faith. You know, Zechariah gets an enunciation from an angel, but he asks a skeptical question. Now, you, you go back there, and you may not see how it differs from Mary's question, but the author of Scripture wants us to get this, the, the human author, which is St. Luke, and the Holy Spirit wants to get it too. Zechariah's question is kind of like a, yeah, but. Sarah, do you, guys, do you ever do a yeah, but? Yeah, but. You ever do that? You ever do one of those? All right. But anyway, that, that, that's what Zechariah does is this ask is skeptical. Well, how the heck can that happen? That, that's kind of the tone. You have, to, you have to get that. He's a priest. He's a priest. He's, he's officiating on duty in the temple, and he has this vision, and he has a skeptical question. And what is his punishment? Penance. Yeah, you get, you know, you might get a Hail Mary, Our Father, Glory, but he got nine months of silence. Wouldn't you love God to give some that penance to some people in your life? <laughs> anyway, he got nine months of silence because he shot his mouth off with a skeptical question. He had to think about that a little bit and learn some things. So it's a loving act of God uh, for him, uh, really. But but anyway. The point is, he asks a skeptical question. Mary asks an innocent question. It's not a wrong to question, but you have to ask questions that are trusting. And she asks one question, and the angel responds, Oh, how's it going to be? Because you don't know, man, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. And so this child's going to be called the Son of God. Well, that's even harder to believe than the first thing the angel said. You're going to be the mother of the Messiah. So Mary just decides, no more questions, and she says, let it be done to me according to your word. Now, that might sound noble and beautiful to you, but think, think about what it cost Mary to say that. The angel appeared to her. At that point in time, she had no idea the angel was going to appear to Joseph. How is she going to explain this to Joseph? And how is she going to explain this to the town elders who will stone her? If she's exposed as an adulteress, she is stoned. So her life is on the line. So when she said that, it wasn't just giving up the dream of having a big family, a normal life. It was like, there's a risk of death here. Rejection by the one that I love and uh, the rejection by the people. My whole family can be throwing stones at me for this. Okay, so... She's risking, she's standing, she, she is trusting, she is surrendering. She's a model of faith in Luke. But if you switch to Matthew, Mary's faith is not highlighted at all by Matthew. The whole focus is Joseph's faith. And I want you really to think this through and think about this in terms of your own way that you respond to God in situations. Because here's the situation. Joseph finds out that his wife, that he loves, that he, she's betrothed to him. And see, one thing you have to understand, in ancient Israel, betrothal is actually wedding one. Like, for us, betrothal nowadays used to be very private. Nowadays, it's, it's become a bigger thing in American culture. Like, when I, when I proposed, you know, usually I actually had other people in on it, but I was a total outlier. Like, everybody proposed in solitude, just, you know, spat, you know, like, like, like the, the, the guy proposes to the girl on one knee and they might have a dinner together afterwards and then they show everyone the ring and, and that, but, but now, you know, people are doing bigger things with parties and stuff. Well, in ancient Israel and to this day in Israel, among Arab Christians who carry on that Middle Eastern culture, the betrothal is a big party, big public party, exchange of gifts, Exchange of also so 
it's, it's really, in ancient Israel, that was the contract started there and you were legally married really, but you didn't yet come into your husband's house. So any, any, any sin after that, like any sexual hanky-panky with someone else is adultery. It's not just fornication or premarital sex. It's adultery, okay? So you got to get that. So, so anyway, Joseph finds out this. Now, it says, Joseph was a just man. And so, I'm just going to stop right there. This is Matthew first chapter, the second chapter of Matthew. So Joseph is a just man, and stop. What does it mean to be a just man? Habakkuk 2 says something about this. The just man shall live by faith, and if he draws back, I will take no pleasure in him. If he shrinks back, think about faith as walking. If you shrink back, I take no... <clears throat> I, I, I do not have any any um, pleasure in him. Okay, that's repeated in the New Testament three times. It's quoted by Paul. It's quoted in Hebrews. Okay, why is it repeated three times? Because justice and righteousness in the Old Testament is inextricably bound up with faith. All right. So Joseph is saying Joseph is a man full of faith. So what does he do? He decides to divorce Mary, send her away quietly. So he, he's not going to expose her to shame and punishment as an adulteress. Now, his heart is broken, and he goes to sleep. Remember, faith, darkness, right? The dark of the night, in a dream, an angel comes to him and says, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. This is of the Holy Spirit, and he will save his people from his sins, so you need to call him by the name God saves, which is Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew, okay? So that's what Jesus means, God will save, God saves. So Joseph wakes up. Now I'm gonna ask you guys this. How many of you trust your dreams? How many of you are gonna make serious decisions on a dream? Can't you second guess a dream and say, huh? But yeah, can't, what, what, I mean, like, has anyone ever said, gosh, where the heck did that come from, that crazy dream I just had? You know? Okay, so, but like Abraham, he doesn't say anything, he just takes her as his wife. He immediately obeys this shaky message in the dead of night in a dream. He obeys it. And he takes her as his wife. Now, the scripture text doesn't tell us that he never again has relations with her, but we know that from church tradition, and that's pretty amazing commitment when you say, the apple of your eye, this beautiful girl, Mary's probably 13 to 18, 13 to 15 years old. We don't know how old Joseph is. There's two traditions. Normal in Israel would be 18 years old or so, um, but, but there's a tradition that he was an old man and a widower. We really don't know which one was right. But anyway, the mirror is probably 13 to 15. It's a kid. It's beautiful, lovely. And anyway, Joseph says, okay. So then we're going to switch to the birth of Jesus. Now, Joseph is okay. Okay, the son of God, this is God. So God's in this. Isn't everything going to line up? You know, if, if this is God, if all the doors are going to open, right? Everything's going to line up. Everything's going to work out fine. And then this, this census, this, and he has to go back to his ancestral village, which is Bethlehem. Okay? And um, it's still in one problem. It's 106 miles away. And it just so happens that it's just as Mary is soon to give birth. So think of a woman nine months pregnant. Now I'm the provider and I can't leave her here to have the baby alone. I got, I got to take her with me all the way down there. And we're talking the 18 mile trek through the desert uphill. So, you know, was she on a donkey? Not sure. Very possible. Whether it's a donkey, can you imagine a pregnant woman nine months leading a, a woman on a donkey? 106 miles? 18 miles up and through a desk. Can you imagine that? That's, that's like 
I mean, what, can you imagine how much, I don't know about you, but I would complain, God, I mean, come on now. You know, if this is you, I would have doubted. Maybe it wasn't God. Maybe that dream really was to screw you. You know, like this is crazy. Why would God do this? Remember, darkness. Okay, remember, faith. God doesn't necessarily show you the big picture long term. Now, how many people know the beautiful little song your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light for my path. Has anyone ever heard that song? You guys have heard it from Amy Graham. Has anyone heard that? That's a quote from Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. Today, we can't quite get this imagery, but I want you to think of this. What is a lamp unto my feet? What is a lamp in the time of Jesus? A lamp is a tiny little clay thing that holds oil in it, can fit in your hand. I have one, I have a first century one in my house. So I wish I could show it to you, but it's, it's that big. And it fits in the palm of your hand. And it was a first century flashlight also. How was it a flashlight? You actually tied it to your feet on top of your sandals and you walked with it. And it only threw light clearly for, you know, a few paces around your feet. And as you walk forward, you see no more. And you walk forward, you see a little But all you see is what you can, the next few steps you need to take, and that's it. And then it starts to fade into blackness. That's the image of the light of faith. That's what walking in faith is like. So, you know, Joseph didn't know the end of the story necessarily. He didn't, you know? So he's on his way to Bethlehem. They get to Bethlehem after this exhausting drive. And this is his, he has kin there. Now they may have all been like eighth cousins, so they may not have known him really well. We don't know. But this this town is where his family came from. And they, you know, so like we're talking distant relatives in this town. And God's going to open the doors. When it's God's plan, the doors are open. The doors were slammed shut in his face. Wait a minute. Is this God? Come on. So where do they have the baby? In a stable. What's a stable? It's not a wooden little stable separate building like we have. Everything pretty much is made out of stone, right? And it's a hillside town and there's natural caves. And in Nazareth there were also natural caves. And you use them, for God's sake. You use the natural caves. You don't have to, you know, build them. You use them. So basically this cave was, we actually know this from second century testimony that in Bethlehem, the stable was a cave. And today, Church of the Nativity is built over that cave, and you can go in that cave, which we do when we go to the Holy Land. We go down there and venerate the spot where Jesus is born. Anyway, cave. Now, in our major scenes at Christmas, we have nice little wooden buildings. We got a nice little clean fake hay. We got a little angel above. It all looks cozy. And the house smells like evergreens because of the tree. Well, that place didn't smell like evergreens, folks. It smelled like, you know what? What do animals do? They don't smell good. Would you want to be having, you're the provider, and the best you can do is a stable where there smells like animals and they're dumb. This is not good for a man. You don't feel good about yourself. But the, here's the point. There's not... You know, there's not one word recorded of Joseph. Not one word. Why is that? We're going to talk in the next talk about one aspect of it, but here's one of the aspects. There's no back talk. There's no, yeah, but. There's, there's no, there's no, oh, God, this is ridiculous. Now, I just want you to know how often that does occur in the Old Testament. God's heroes give him back talk. Moses gave God back. And actually, he got impatient with God and didn't do things exactly right. The people were driving him crazy. He hit the rock twice instead of once. And what happens? That's so serious a sin that Moses doesn't make it into the promised land. He only sees it from afar. Now, Joseph did better. He didn't, no back talk. No, why did you give me these grumbling people? 
You know, the, the Israelites grumbled in the desert. Why'd you lead us out here into this desert? We could have died in Egypt if you were going to lead us out to die. At least we had decent food there. You know, we're, we're hungry. So God says, man, sends man. They complain. <laughs> we're thirsty. God brings water out of the rock. They still complain. God, said, God, God says, uh, okay, I'm going to send you meat. You don't like this? I'm going to send you meat. He sends a quail. He says, I'm going to send meat, and you're going to eat it until it's coming out of your nose. But they complained. They just complained. Who else complained? Who else complained? Elijah. Oh, God. You know, he works this great miracle. He slays the prophets of Baal. And his reward is the queen wants to kill him. So he has to run out, and he has a pity party. 2 Kings 16. He lay, he's out by this tree, and he's, oh, God, take my life. Uh, how about Jeremiah? Jeremiah complains. Oh, that you duped me, Lord, and I let myself be duped. Job, incredible guy. How about him? He complains. But see, here's the point. Joseph does not complain. Joseph does not grumble. Joseph gives no back talk. He just does. That's the power of the biblical testimony about Joseph's silence. He does it. Now listen, then, then the baby's born. Okay, shepherds come. That's cool. And they say angels appear. That's cool. And then the, the wise men come. That's really cool. And they leave gifts. That's great. And then the, ne the next morning, Joseph wakes up, and he, he's had another dream. In the darkness, the angel comes again and says, okay, Joseph, Herod wants to kill the child. Flee to Egypt. Egypt? <laughs> Egypt? He, it was only 100 miles down here. That's 200 miles. And Egypt is a place of slavery. We celebrate every year how we escaped from Egypt. You want to lead me back to Egypt? He didn't say any of that. I would have. And not only I, I bet Moses would have. And I bet Elijah would have. And Jeremiah would have. But Joseph didn't say nothing. What do you do? He gets up and walks. Walk by faith. Not by sight. And we're talking 200 miles. So then, guess what? He gets a third dream. All right, take the child and go back to the land of Israel. Really? We're just getting comfortable here. We just got to know people here. I got a job. You know, life's not so bad. There's a Jewish community here. There was a Jewish community in Egypt. You know how long this walk is? Remember, it's back to Israel and then 100 miles north to Nazareth. 300 miles. 300 miles. Okay, would you have second guessed these dreams? Would you have complained about this? Joseph did. That's the point. Why he is a model of faith. Remember, Jesus is a model of obedience, of course. That's part of faith, right? And he's a model of commitment, of course, and, and of trust, of course. But just keep in mind, he didn't have the darkness. Joseph had, had a model of that trust and commitment, but he had the darkness. And that's why Joseph is, is like us. I mean, we have that darkness, don't we? Does, don't things sometimes seem like, how could this be God? How could this be God's plan for my life? I mean, things are going wrong. Does that happen to you? Okay, so Joseph is a patron to pray in those circumstances, to ask him for that, that gift of stronger, stronger faith. That faith that doesn't grumble. The faith that doesn't second guess what God is saying. Now, it is true, sometimes we can make mistakes. And uh, not, not sinful mistakes, but we can make a mistake about a job or a financial thing or, you know. You know, we, we, when we're trying to listen to God and get His will, we're really trying. We can still make slight mistakes. But here's the beautiful thing about faith, okay? The truth is that even the mistakes we make, God turns them around and there are detours where we learn stuff that's valuable and he still brings us back to where he wants us to be. That's happened to me a million times. I don't, when, you know, when I realized that I've made some mistakes or some bad things have happened that, that maybe I didn't get it right exactly, um, you know, sometimes I'm tempted not to see this or to, to, to complain about it. But I'm just going to tell you that that's part of faith too, is trusting that God is going, if I'm well-intentioned, God is going to bring me where I need to be. And here's the other thing. You never want to sin 
presuming on God's forgiveness. But in the past, you realize you've sinned and you've really screwed up and you've gotten involved in bad stuff. But God still can turn that, transform that, and bring greater good out of that. And that's the answer to those who say, well, if God really exists, why is there evil in the world? And the answer is, number one, human freedom. And we all know that because God doesn't control human beings. So human beings decide to sin. It's not God deciding to make them sin. They are responsible for the evil that they do. However, how about all the innocent people they hurt? God is so powerful in his providence that he can actually bring greater good out of that evil. And he only allows evil insofar as he can bring greater good out of it. The cross being the number one example. But I'll just give you another one from my own experience. I grew up every night of my life as a kid growing up, my mother was drunk. Every night. Sometimes it was really embarrassing. She was passed out on the floor. I bring friends in at seven o'clock at night and she passed, she fell off the chair and passed out on the floor. Okay, so you know what? That wasn't good. Three out of four of my grandparents died from alcoholism. That wasn't good. That's evil, don't you think? Addiction's evil. But I'll tell you what, my mom <clears throat> recovered. Um, and she became a phenomenal help to an amazing number of people. I mean, she, she did a, a lot to help other alcoholics. And right now she's praying for this retreat. She's a prayer warrior. But me going through all that, I discovered how much it affected me and impacted me uh, pretty late, actually, in life. And I had to go through a lot of therapy and counseling and stuff and uh, join Al Al-Anon. Um, but you know, I see this, this, this whole thing as a great blessing. It enables me and my mom to understand people that we could, we never would have been able to understand and help people that we never could have been able to help. And there's actually virtues that we had to build that a lot of people aren't forced to build when they don't live in this situation. And the virtue brings freedom. And so it's a just amazing how much freedom the Lord has brought to us and our family and how much wisdom He's brought to us in our family an ability to understand other people. And so we give thanks now for this cross of alcoholism that took lives. My dad died, although he was sober when he died. He, it, was, it was alcoholism that destroyed his liver and led to liver cancer that killed him. But thank God, you know, he had two really good years of sobriety before that, you know, took his life from this world. But here's my point. God even brought that, that tragedy and, and sin that was involved in the tragedy he brought it around. So for us, Joseph is a call to that kind of faith, of walking even in the darkness, trusting that God's leading us, even when we've screwed up in the past, even when we've made a mistake, that he can make it good. That, is, that brings great joy in the midst of the darkness. And that's what Joseph really is about, one of the things that he, is, he wants to teach us. So we're going to take some time to discuss that. And like two questions that I, I would just ask you to, to roll around. And you guys are free to discuss more, but if, if you need a question to get going in the discussion group. <clears throat> As brothers, how can we support each other better in growing and walking in faith as sons of St. Joseph. So how can we support each other better as brothers? Okay? Um, and the other question is, do I grumble or give God back talk? And if so, how can I change that pattern? How can I change the pattern of complaining or back talk? Okay, and I'm going to just tell you a couple of things um, about resources. How can we support each other better? You can't live Christian life as men alone. You need brotherly support. You need, if you're married, of course your wife is a tremendous support to you. But you need brotherly support. Remember ancient Israel and how Joseph grew up. Remember, the guys prayed together, pilgrimaged together, and supported one another in living out the law. And, and that's normal. We live in a weird society today where, you know, just guys are kind of on their own. You know what I mean? And, and so anyway, 
this, I give a talk called Blessings of Brotherhood, and it's really about men growing to be spiritual leaders and fathers and how we need each other as a band of brothers, you know, and how we can support each other. So anyway, the question I'm not gonna ask you guys to talk about is someone addressed in the CD. And so these CDs say nine bucks, but we're, we're offering all the CDs up there, the single ones for five bucks. So if anyone would like that talk, I'd encourage you to get it. I think it'd be a blessing for you guys if you have a CD player. And um, there's also another um, book. You, some of you guys know the story of Louis Zamperini. I brought two books having to do with California men. This guy <clears throat> probably was born Catholic. I doesn't say in the book. He's Italian, I assume he was born Catholic. But he was juvenile delinquent, uh, straightened out because he got into athletics. Um, this is just a great man story. He got into the Army. Um, World War II, his plane shot down in the Pacific, um, and he, he becomes, a, it's just an unbelievable story of endurance. Japanese prison camp, brutality. And the amazing thing about it is, if you saw the movie, the movie doesn't tell enough of the story. It leaves out the spiritual thing. Louis came back to the States a broken man. The book says unbroken, he was broken. And Louis just could not, he, he had dreams, but not the good kind that Joseph had. He had dreams of being in a prison camp and of killing the, the man who tormented him. He hated him with a passion. And so one night he woke up uh, to screams and he was choking his wife because in his dream he was choking this guy. So he was filled with hate, he became alcoholic. His marriage was about to break up. He got dragged to a really grand crusade by his wife, and he gave his life to the Lord. And um, he became a man full of forgiveness. He went back and met with every captor that, he, that would meet with him and told him that he loved him and he forgave him. It's, it's just amazing, it's an amazing story. And what I love about it is, it's a great story just of inspiration, but it's a great way to evangelize other men because you don't know that there's a religious punchline to the story. So it's not a religious book. It's a great war story. You know, it's an adventure story. It's a sports story. And then you find out that the, he spends the rest of his life afterwards serving the Lord uh, in forgiveness and mercy and working with juvenile delinquents like he was once. It's a great, great book. So anyway, there's a few copies of it up here. Through the, I encourage you guys to get it if you can. And if, it, if I run out, you can order them from us or you can just get them on Amazon or something. Okay, but it's, just, it's a great story. So anyway, those are a few things that... I just want to pitch again this book. Even if you don't get the whole series, get the book, Jesus, The Way, The Truth, and Life. It will blow your mind uh, in terms of helping you come to see stuff you never saw in the Gospels. It really help you um, fall in love with Jesus in, in a very manly way, um, like the disciples did. Okay? So, all right, we're going to take a break now. And uh, how much time do we have for the, for the discussion? Yeah. Uh, let's go to the same rooms you were in last night for small groups. And please come out for lunch at 12.15. And uh, I've read this book. It is fantastic. It's really well written. I've read this book. It's fantastic. It's really well written. <laughs> See you guys for lunch at 12.15. Enjoy your small groups. <laughs> <laughs>